webinar, people will be admitted as we go. I don't have to keep keep going. So first of all, hello everybody. My name is Susan and I'm going to be the host for the session tonight. The way in which this is going to work is it's going to run in three different parts. We're going to start off with the introduction from a couple of people who are going to tell us all about life from the actuarial profession, but they're going to come from multiple different perspectives. The first perspective is going to be from Sinead, who is A, a practicing actuary, and B, a senior, uh, a senior professional within her organization. And she's going to tell us a little bit about the job she does, how she got there, and also some insights about maybe things that we may not necessarily assume or know about the actuarial profession. And then after that, we're going to have uh, another couple of people who are going to share their insights with us as well along the way and as we go along you're also going to meet a couple of panelists who are going through the process of um going through their going through their exams and also sorry i will i should special uh, i should correct myself there just finish their exams and in a very relieved position now so you'll hear all all about those as well and in addition you're going to hear uh, or in the middle, what we're also going to have is an active learning session as well, in between where I'm going to ask you to think like actions as we go along. So on that note, I am going to uh, just going to start off there now, and we're going to, to hand over to Sinead Clark, who is from Milliman, and going to take us away with the first uh, contribution for our session tonight. Sinead, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um... Thanks a million for joining the session tonight. Um, I hope that you learn lots about the actuarial profession from this session. Um, my name is Sinead Clark, as Susan said. I work for a company called Milliman. We're an actuarial consultancy company. Um, so my job is to work with clients um, and help solve their problems. Um, I sat the Leaving Cert in 2002. Um, which is over 20 years ago, which is a bit scary. Um, I went on to study actuarial and financial studies in UCD and I started my career as an actuary in 2006. Um, I took about four years to finish the professional exams um, and I qualified as an actuary in 2010. I then said, do you know what, I'm going to head off and travel around the world for a little bit. So I took six months off and traveled around the world with my boyfriend, now husband, um, and had a ball um, and came back. And I've been working at Milliman ever since um, as a consulting actuary. Um, I don't think I fully understood what it actually did when I put it down in my CAO and that's part of the reason why I was very um, happy to be involved in a session like this for senior cycle students just so you can kind of have a good sense of what this profession and career is like and um, if you are thinking of putting it down. Um, I loved maths and maths was my favourite subject in school um, and I, I knew I wanted to work in a business context rather than a science context um, so from that point of view um, actuarial and financial studies um, seems like a good fit um, and I'm delighted that I did it I haven't looked back um, but I suppose I'd like to just um, share some maybe misconceptions about what an actuary does or what I thought maybe an actuary did um, so I think when I was a student um, I would have thought that an actuary does lots of work um, with spreadsheets and charts and numbers. Um, this guy to me is probably what I thought an actuary looked like, um, a man um, sitting behind a desk with lots of screens, lots of anal uh, analytics. And this is an article from the Guardian newspaper um, about what an actuary does. So this, this guy is an actuary. Um, I think I would have thought I'd spent lots of time in an office um, you know, working with others and um, trying to calculate um, uh, lots of different things. Um, and I think maybe that this would be all that my job was about and all that my life was about working on numbers and working um, behind a computer screen. Um, and then, of course, lots of people would have said to me, oh, actuaries, they make lots of money. So I definitely thought that that was something an actuary did. But um, I suppose I have learned since that actuaries do lots of different things. So I thought it'd be useful um, even just to look at what Google says an actuary does. Um, so if you Google what an actuary does, you come up with, these are the kind of responses that you get. Um, actuaries use mathematical skills to measure the probability and risk of future events. 
um, pro- actually it's a problem solvers and strategic thinkers. And um, they mostly work in the insurance industry, be it with life insurers, um, non-life insurers, which are sometimes called property and casualty insurers or general insurers. They're insurers that um, would insure your car or your house or your mobile phone, for example, whereas life insurers provide um, uh, insurance policies that would be paid out on death or maybe mortgage, mortgage protection policies. Um, health insurers we also work with and lots of actuaries work in the pension sector as well. Um, and their day-to-day work includes working out the premium of insurance policies. Um, so actuaries would look at the um, claims associated with the insurance policy, the probability of claim or the or the value of a claim and try and work out um, what the premium might be. Um, actuaries calculate liabilities for insurance companies. Um, so if any of you study business, you'll understand um, that there's uh, on a balance sheet, there are assets and liabilities um, for an insurance company when they sell a premium, the cash or the payment they receive as an asset, but they need to put a liability on their balance sheet that corresponds to the potential claim. Um, and that can be quite um, complicated to calculate because it depends on a certain event occurring. Um, and actually, that, that's a core um role of an actuary within the insurance industry. Um, We also advise on investments to ensure that insurance companies have enough money to pay claims as they fall due. Um, And we draw interesting insights from historic data to make predictions about the future. Lots of actuaries are working in um, with big data and using big data to try and infer how uh, events might occur in the future. And then finally, we develop mathematical models to understand risks. So lots of actuaries work with different types of coding systems or Python, um, for example, to build models to help calculate some of these things, to calculate premiums or to calculate liabilities. So there's lots of different things that that actuaries do in this area. And Google provides a a good example of those. But I'm hoping that the people that you hear today will give you real life examples of what they do rather than just Google. Um, So then if you were to maybe dig a little deeper and look into the society of actuaries, you'd come across some pictures like this of real life actuaries. Um, the people in the top up here, um, these um, are a head of actuarial functions. So they have a specific role within an insurance company and they have a very um, protective role. So their role within the company is to sign off to ensure that the insurance company has enough money to pay the claims of the policyholders um, when they fall through, so if they when, when they are, are due. Um, so a lot of the time actuaries have a very policyholder centric uh, or policyholder first role within an insurance company. Um, these are recently qualified actuaries. That's me um, back in 2013 when I um, had qualified and I'm speaking at an event. And then um, all of these guys down here are actuaries that finished their professional exams a few years ago. Um, but just because all of these people are in suits and and they look very professional, that doesn't mean that um, it's all um, <clears throat> no fun and it, it's all uh, about the work. Actuaries have plenty of time to do lots of different things um, as well as as work. Um, so we work hard, but we play hard too. Um, so this picture here of the scuba diving actuary is Yvonne. Um, she is the CEO of the Society of Actuaries and she's going to speak after me. Um, these are my colleagues that took part in a um, Grant Thornton 5K for charity last year. And um, we have a lot of a lot of my colleagues are avid um, runners that run marathons um, and half marathons. And at a different point in my life before I had children, I, I used to run half marathons as well. So um, I work with a very energetic um, and sporty bunch. Um, this is an ex-colleague of mine that's also a musician. Um, and down here we have a kind of a mix of actuaries. This was at our um, the Society of Actuaries 50th anniversary um, event last year. So within Ireland, the Society of Actuaries just turned 50. Um, so we've uh, we've been a ver- the actuary profession is a very long profession in the UK, but in Ireland the Society of Actuaries is 50 years old. Um, so I hope that, again, the actuaries you'll meet today will show um, you a kind of a diverse range of different people coming from different backgrounds um, within the profession. And then kind of to finally answer that question of what does an actuary do? 
actuaries do lots of things um, and, and, and more. So this gives you um, an idea of some of the jobs that I've done throughout my career. Um, and the people who speak after me will tell you about some of the things that they're doing in their career. And it's different from mine. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the jobs. And then I have um, a little bit about the skills that I've learned um, just to try and demonstrate that I haven't spent the past um, 20 plus years sitting behind a computer screen um, uh, working for an insurance company. I've done lots of things um, and I, I'm only getting started in my career. I'm probably have another 20 plus years um, before I get to retirement. So I aim to do a lot more. Um, so when I started working, I worked as a valuations actuary. That's um, where you work on a team of actuaries and you're calculating liabilities for an insurance company, like I mentioned at the start. And that's where I developed my core actuarial skills, some of those skills were very useful when I went to sit the exams because a lot of the exams, <clears throat> excuse me, the professional exams are based on those core actuarial skills. Um, I work in a consultancy and um, so um, I get to, I got to be involved on lots of different projects. Some of those included um, big M&A projects where an insurance company was purchasing another insurance company and we had to help advise on a price for that purchase. They are generally very confidential, but very interesting projects to be involved in. I have worked with startups, so new companies that have come and set up in Ireland and built a company from scratch. Um, and I've worked with them in developing their actuarial systems um, and their risk management systems and just helping advise them on what an insurance company should look like and what's expected in Ireland from the regulations and legislation point of view. Um, I was an avid coder back in my day and would have developed lots of um, models um, to help on the actuarial valuation side primarily. Um, using actuarial software, um, but generally using code such as C++. Um, in my most <clears throat> recently, um, I have spent a lot of time working with health insurers. Um, I am a head of actuarial function for a health insurer based in Ireland that sells health insurance um, to uh, other companies, other countries um, around the world, international health insurance. Um, and as part of that role, I have to sign off that the company has sufficient liabilities um, every year to support its policyholders. Um, and that's a very important role um, in Ireland and under the um, uh, insurance uh, legislation. Um, and then I have also spent a lot of time in risk management. So risk management is a probably... A newer area for actuaries um, to be um, part of since the financial crash in 2008, there has been a lot of um, more focus on risk management across insurance companies and banks um, and the investment sector. And that is an area that a lot of actuaries work in, in insurance companies. And it's a in, very interesting area and an area that continues to develop. Um, and even within that risk management space, climate change and the risks posed by climate change are, is a new and emerging area there. Um, and finally, um, I've learned lots of skills in my career as well. So obviously, maths and technical ability are core to an actuarial um, skill set, but you need lots of other skills as well. Um, problem solving is important, and I think we um, learn how to do that based on our technical um, mathematical um, ability but it is a different skill set um, because you're applying that technical mathematical knowledge to kind of real day problems where you mightn't actually use equations to solve them you use kind of strategic thinking um, storytelling is really important and being able to bring other people along um, to explain complex mathematical or, or technical um, detail to key stakeholders in companies. So I, I work regularly with executive management and the board of directors and I need to be able to explain complex um, actuarial output to them so that they can use that information to make key decisions within the company. So within insurance companies, actuar uh, head of actuarial function are core to the senior management team. Um, and with that comes leadership and influencing skills. So I need to be able to, you know, use my leadership skills to um, lead in the senior executive team. Um, but also within my role within Milliman, um, I had a team of eight people reporting to me um, last year and I needed to use my leadership skills to kind of work with them and help develop their careers. Um, so that kind of people management aspect comes into it as you build out in your career, many actuaries become managers um, and take on that kind of people management role as well. 
public speaking is important um, in some cases for me as a consultant. Um, it tends to form an important part of my career. I, ca I can't say it's a part I love, um, particularly um, if I hark back to my school days, like I wasn't. I'm still not very comfortable speaking in public, um, but I do do a lot of it um, and it's an area that I am always trying to improve in um, and for some actuaries um, it's 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 an area that they 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 spend a lot of time in um, even whether it's public speaking to a group of this of 50 people or um, you know speak presenting to 10 people in a senior management team those kind of public speaking skills are important um, project management is important because a lot of the work that actuaries do uh, have either quite tight deadlines and um, we prepare numbers for year end accounts, um, for example, or we work on projects um, within insurance companies or with our clients that, that may have deadlines because they're driven by regulatory needs and regulatory timelines, for example. And then innovation, marketing and research and development are all important and lots of actuaries within insurance companies might move into these areas. Um, insurance companies will need to update their product structure from from time to time and actuaries can be very much involved in that and um, for me working in a consultancy I always need to be um, up to date on industry knowledge and to try and understand what new issues the insurance industry is going to face so that I'm very capable to talk to my clients about them so innovation marketing and R&D are also important so that skill set is probably very different to what I would have thought and um, when I think back to leaving cert I would have thought that it was a huge focus on maths and technical ability and that the majority of my career would be spent calculating numbers and um, a lot of my career involves numbers but the calculation aspect of it isn't something that I necessarily do anymore I use a lot more of these other skills now within a management and leadership role within the organization and some of my more junior staff are really in the depths of the numbers um, and the calculation and the and the model development so I hope that that has given you a kind of an overview of what a career might look like within the actuarial profession um, and hopefully the speakers later on today are also um, going to tell you a little bit more about their careers and what they do on a day to day basis that will help provide more information. So um, I'd like to say um, thank you as well to our sponsors before I hand over um, to Susan, um, who have provided um, a lot of um, support to help us develop our transition year program and then also this event today. Thank you very much indeed for that, Sinead. And I'm always intrigued by the scuba diving picture. We never expect to see that one for a start. Um, but also I love that graphic that you have at the end where you've got the green colours there representing the more mathematical skills, etc. And then the skills, as you say, that you've developed in a more senior capacity as well and following the path. What I didn't know about you before, and I'm grateful, everyone, I'm grateful to say that I've worked with Sinead now for, for a while. I never knew you were an avid coder in your day, <laughs> as you as you say. So uh, you learn something new every single time. So Sinead, thank you very much indeed for, first of all, for sharing that with us and also for sharing your contact detail too. And that's very kind of you to share those. Um, as we are indeed going to take questions and all of that, but that's going to be held on panel session later on. We're also going to give you another way of submitting questions in a little while too, when we're doing the active learning session. So if there are anything, please do feel free to pop them into the Q&A section and I will either pass them on to Sinead, pass them on to the panel, or else we will answer them uh, a little bit later on. Sinead, thank you again Excellent. for being with us. Okay, <clears throat> so the next person that I'm going to ask to join us now is Yvonne. So Yvonne, if I could ask you to turn on your camera, please. So Yvonne is the CEO of the Society of Actuaries in Ireland. Uh, she is also, as she mentioned there a while ago, she is the scuba diver in in, um, in Sinead's picture. And <clears throat> uh, she, she's going to tell us some really, really interesting statistics all around the Society of Actuaries in Ireland. It is this year, 50 years old. And of course, that marks a really important um, milestone for the actuary, uh, for the actuarial profession. And she's going to talk about the plethora of different ways that people can engage with actuarial skills, but outside of the traditional roles of an actuary, even outside of the ones that Sinead mentioned. And the other thing as well, that one of my favorite statistics is that Ireland has the most amount of actuaries per head of the population in the world. So all of those types of things is, is what you're going to hear, um, is, is what you're going to hear Yvonne talk about. So, we, uh, hello, hello sorry. Yvonne. You're probably wondering, am I here at all? And I am, but I'm getting a message, Susan, saying you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. 
Okay, well then I will take a look at that now and I will okay, see why that might be. Okay, there we go, Yvonne. Sorted. Oh, I am. <laughs> perfect, perfect indeed. I'm going to hand it over to you. And I knew very well that, that you were there, all right. So no <laughs> doubt, no, no doubt about that indeed. And because I'm again very grateful that I've heard Yvonne speak before, some of your statistics, well, no, sorry, not some of them, all of your statistics are always really, really interesting to hear Yvonne. <laughs> and the floor is now yours. Okay, thanks, Susan. And hello, everybody, and thanks so much for coming along this evening um, here at the Society of Actors. We're delighted to bring you this webinar um, and delighted to have Susan helping us with this as well. And very grateful also to our sponsors who were mentioned by Sinead there. And also, I must say a huge thank you to the actuaries who have come along this evening to share their experiences with you and to answer your questions. Um, I think you're, you're in, for, in for a very insightful and informative session. So as uh, um, Susan said there, I'm Chief Executive of the Society of Actuaries. I, I am an actuary myself. Uh, <laughs> Sinead was talking about it being 20 years, I think she said, since she left school. I left school long before that, I must confess. <laughs> but I can still remember at the time telling people that I was going to become an actuary and being met with blank stares and confused looks and questions like, why do you want to be an actor? Or is that something to do with? archery <laughs> and I think nowadays there is more awareness of the actuary profession but there is still quite a lot of mystique about what do actuaries do on a day-to-day -day basis so hopefully um, during the course of this webinar we'll we'll manage to dispel some of that mystique for you. Um, well as Sinead said most actuaries do work in insurance or pensions um, or in firms that provide services into those businesses. And indeed that's reflected in our range of sponsors this evening. So Irish Life, New Ireland and Zurich are all insurance companies providing life insurance, savings plans. And in the case of Zurich, non-life insurance or general insurance. So covering your covering cars, homes, mobile phones and the like. And then Aon and Milliman, also leaders in their field. Aon is a professional services firm that provides services to insurers as well as to a wide range of other uh, businesses. And Milliman, Sinead's firm, is an actuary consultancy specialising in the insurance space. So I will give you a flavour that there are lots of actuaries working in these types of companies. Um, now, insurance and pensions, I don't think any of us wake up in the morning thinking I must take out an insurance policy today or I must start my pension plan today. We all I suppose like to spend today and enjoy ourselves and put off saving for the rainy day but insurance and pensions are areas of work where we can make a real difference to people's lives because when mishaps happen and unfortunately they do they happen to all of us we have enough to be worrying about, we have enough stress to deal with besides worrying about financial consequences. And that's where insurance really comes into play. It provides protection against financial loss at times when people need it most. Actually, it's not just about protection anymore. Increasingly, insurers are getting involved in incentivizing people and supporting people in leading healthy lifestyles so that there's less risk of these bad events occurring. And hopefully that means more of us will reach old age in good shape. And that's where a good pension plan or a savings plan really comes into its own, allowing us to lead a very comfortable lifestyle in our twilight years. Um, now, again, uh, Sinead talked about how actuaries use mathematical tools, mathematical techniques to assess risks in insurance. We look to see how we can best pool the risks of large groups of people to provide protection and financial support to individuals when they need it most. And we also work to ensure that insurance companies and pension funds are run well, so that when the claims come to be paid or when the pensions come to be paid, the money is indeed there for people. And that may be many years from when people first started paying premiums or putting their savings aside. But actuary work isn't just about insurance and pensions and increasingly actuaries are, are moving into more diverse fields. Actuaries are essentially problem solvers. So we use our, our mathematical skills to solve practical business problems, particularly in relation to managing finances and in relation to assessing and managing risk. So the, the actuary skill set 
includes being able to analyze and interpret large volumes of data and use it to gain insights <coughs> and to make predictions about all sorts of things from economic conditions through to customer behaviors in different scenarios. And that's a, a set of skills that can be used to add value in lots of different types of businesses. So even within our own membership, we have people working in, uh, let's see, we have people working in the aviation industry in a variety of roles from, from managing the leasing of aircraft to doing flight safety analysis. We We've got people working in government departments, in telecommunications, in the tech, legal, healthcare sectors, also in financial regulation. Uh, Paddy Power, the bookmakers have hired actuaries to do modelling of, of uh, sports outcomes and predictions so that they can set their odds properly, or set their odds in their favour probably. Um, Elon Musk, the creator of the Tesla car and the SpaceX uh, rockets and satellite technology, has looked for, what did he say, revolutionary actuaries um, for his Tesla insurance business. Uh, to give you a few examples of actuaries in somewhat unusual roles, there's an actuary who has set up a company that's developing an app that will allow people to track their diet simply by taking a photo of their meal from their smartphone. Uh, there's an actuarial consultancy that specializes in developing programs to reward customer loyalty in all sorts of businesses. And in the UK, there's an actuary who has set up a company that aims to transform the pet insurance market through innovative use of technology combined with excellent customer service. Uh, this guy's name is, is Stephen Mandel in 2019, he was included in the London Business School review of 30 people who are changing the world, which I think is quite an achievement. And his company ranked in the Sunday Times Tech Track 100 for three consecutive years as one of the UK's fastest growing tech businesses. So that's an example of an actually making um, a, who is quite an entrepreneurial uh, leaning and using his actuarial skills to apply to a new business model. Here at the society, we, we try to support actuaries and having the skills and knowledge that they need for the current roles that they're doing, but also for the opportunities that might emerge in the future. Um, as Susan mentioned, we're, we're 50 years old now. When the society was established, there were just 17 actuaries in Ireland. When I started in the exams back in 1981, there were about 50. And when I finished the exams in 1987, I've... Um, along with well, a number of people, but in particular, along with Evelyn Burke, who went on to become group chief executive of Bupa, the international healthcare company. Evelyn and I were the first two females in Ireland to complete the actuarial exams. Um, now, today we have about 2000 members in the society, about 600 of them are trainee actuaries and about a third are females. We would like to have lots more females in the actuary profession, and there's no reason not to. Uh, the females in, in the profession are just as skilled, just as capable, just as talented, just as effective as the males. So if you have ideas on how we can attract more females into the profession, we certainly would be interested to hear them. Um, so at about 2,000 members, that is a relatively small profession, but it is a small profession in a small country. And as Susan said, we have in Ireland more actuaries per head of population than anywhere else in the world. And sometimes people say, oh, are there too many actuaries then? Will there be jobs for me if I go into this profession? But in fact, the demand for actuaries remains high. It's high in the traditional areas. It's growing in the, the other uh, fields of business that actuaries are gradually expanding into. And the... Um, the financial rewards aren't too shabby either. <laughs> so, for example, when you finish the actuarial exam, so you might be about early to mid 20s at this stage, you could expect salary levels of about 75 to 80,000. Um, by the time you get to, say, your early to mid 30s, that would have gone up to about 125 to 150,000. Beyond that, the opportunities for progression are certainly many. Uh, and really how, how you progress, how quickly and how far you progress depends on the seniority of the roles that you take up. Uh, Sinead mentioned that a lot of actuaries move into management roles and some move into very senior positions and it affords them very comfortable lifestyles, shall we say. So, so as well as being a financially rewarding career, it is a career that offers a lot of opportunities and opportunities to, to shape your career and take it in the direction that best suits your particular interests and your particular talents. 
uh, within the society, we try to provide lifelong learning opportunities for members so that, uh, as I said earlier, they can keep the skills sharp and relevant. Um, completing the actuarial exams is just the first step on a successful career. And I think as with any career, it's important to remain curious and keep your knowledge and your skills fresh and up to date. We also set standards that apply to actuary work to make sure that the work is done to the highest professional standards, because that is really important for the reputation of the profession. And reputations are hard won, but sadly, they can be easily lost. So that is very important to us. We also engage with government and we contribute to public discussions on matters where an actuary perspective can add value. So, for example, a particularly topical area will be climate change. And uh, we've recently signed up to an international profession body's climate action charter. And that will give us a, a, a strong foundation for collaboration with other professionals to tackle this, this global challenge. Our, our, our work is, we have, we have a small secretariat in the society. We have a staff of nine, but at any one time, ooh, maybe 300 of our members are actively involved in that work and they bring their energy, their enthusiasm, their knowledge, their wisdom, their curiosity and their willingness to give back, not just to the profession, but to the public interest. And I think that that's one of the fantastic um, characteristics of this profession is the, the strong sense of community and the um, that that that's that spirit of, of wanting to contribute um i hope that one day some of you will, will become actuaries too and come and join us in our work um but you have time i suppose to make decisions like about that and uh, for the moment i i hope you really enjoyed this evening's webinar i hope that you get a lot out of it if you go away afterwards and you you still have questions or you're reflecting something and you you want to know some more do get in touch with us e email us at info at actuaries.ie and we'd be very happy to, to 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 clear up any 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 questions any confusion that that you might have i wish all of you every luck in um making your choices in the next couple of years, I suppose, about what careers you might follow. And I wish you every success, whatever path you might choose to take. OK, Vaughan, thank you so much indeed for that. And okay. based on what both you and Sinead are saying, the questions are flying in here. Oh, good. <laughs> to our Q&A, yes. Anybody can see see them there as they are flying in, which is wonderful. Please do keep them coming. And there's lots and lots of scope for for that to be answered and um, there is one area that i would just like to ask you about Yvonne, and that is it has been asked but it's always asked whenever we're okay. working with with people interested in the actuarial profession you mentioned that the financial awards are not too shabby now, <laughs> could you elaborate a what does that mean but b and more importantly really how does progression happen is it as you pass your exams is it when you start in a job as a fully fledged actuary that that happens? Could you just talk us through how does it's, the market view this? Yeah, it's a mixture of those things, um, um, Susan. So, so most people enter the actuary profession by first taking a university degree. Um, and there are specialist uh, um, actuarial degrees that people can take and through those they can get exemptions from a lot of the professional exams and they would still have a few professional exams to do while also working. Now there are different routes and people don't have to take an actuarial degree, it could be a different type of degree. Indeed, you don't absolutely have to go to college at all. You could start from school and work your way up in a company. But say taking the typical route where people um, do an actuarial degree and they get a number of exemptions and they they join a company, then I think salaries at that level are on. So so just out of university are probably around the forty to fifty grand mark, mm -hmm. and then over the next two two to three years, when people um, people will be working. Um, building up work experience, acquiring on the job skills and doing their exams as well. By the time they finish their exams and over that period, um, their probably salaries are likely to reach about 75, 80,000. Then, um, then people continue to learn on the job. <laughs> Completing the exams doesn't mean that you know everything, but, mm. but you will find once you qualify that you are quickly given more responsibility. You know, 
you, you, you do come out of the exams with a huge wealth of knowledge and very broad knowledge about the business and about how businesses run. And it's not just about technical actuarial stuff, but it is just broader business knowledge. And so you will quickly find a lot of people in other parts of the business looking to you and so forth. So you really do have opportunities to shine. <laughs> and um, people progress then by performing well on the job and by taking on new roles. It's always good to seek opportunities to to um, tr try out new areas that may be within your own company or maybe by moving company. I always recommend to people as well that they look for opportunities to collaborate with people from others, other disciplines, because you learn a lot by working with people who drink, bring different perspectives to things. Um, so uh, so um, just through, through developing on the job, people will progress, they'll get more senior positions in their company. People will then take different tracks. People might go into very technical roles. Some people love that and, and shine in very technical roles. Other people prefer to go into maybe more general management roles where they're bringing their actuary knowledge to bear on decisions that might affect things like the design of a product or how to, how to sell a product, the marketing of products, how to, um, how to serve customers in the most, well, customer friendly way. And, um, and basically just different aspects of, of running the business. Whichever route people take, the opportunities for actuaries are enormous because actuaries have such a broad skill set that they tend to shine in whatever area they are. So there really are opportunities to, to play to your own particular interests and skills. And progression beyond that really does, it's it's not... It, at that stage, it's not really a function of how many years post qualification ex experience have you. It's what did you do on the job in that yeah. period? How did you develop your skills? And what, what, how much responsibility were you prepared to accept in the roles that you took on? And how well did you do in discharging that responsibility? Does well, that thank you very much for, first of all, putting a number on it and also pointing out the different pivot points that can happen. And also the fact that there is a great progression would be that there's also progression that can happen in multiple different directions yes thank yeah. you very very much for that yeah. i'm always again intrigued with how we can go from elon musk all the way out to <laughs> flights and how you can manage <laughs> safety and all that sort of data as well as the applicability in, in many other directions yeah. so yvonne thank you very much indeed for being you're here. very welcome thank you and now our next person that i'm going to ask to turn on the camera is allison now allison is at a different stage of her career. Alison, you have just finished one or two of your exams. I just said one this time. Just one, one, one this time. So as you can tell, Alison is going through the process of studying. So you're, you're past college, Alison, and then now you're in, in the throes of the exams. Of course, you're also working as well at the same time. So managing the two together. Often when people are interested in this area, they want to know and like you can probably see some of the questions coming through, how long does it take? What's the process like? But often people want to know, Alison, what's it like to work and study at the same time? What sort of supports are there on the part of the company? Is it possible to do it? Can you come out the other side, et cetera? So now that you're in the heart of it, could you please tell us your story and tell us all about your path to where you work? Yes, of course. Um, so I'll just share my screen for you guys. No, so, um, so yeah, as Susan said, um, my name is Alison. I also work with Milliman with Sinead. Um, so I'm an associate consultant. So I've only been with Milliman for two years. So I'm kind of at that stage of my career where I'm doing a lot of the technical work still. Um, so calculating liabilities. Um, I've worked on M and A's, um, but also through work, I'm on different committees. Um, where I get the chance to kind of work on my soft skills. So I'm on the innovation committee and the marketing committee, which I really enjoy. And um, today I'm going to be talking a lot about the route to becoming an actuary. And um, so what that entails from college uh, right through to the professional exams. Um, so first things first, there are some minimum requirements and um, that you must achieve before you can become a registered student with the IFOA. And um, that's the examining body for the actuarial exams. Um, so just to note, you don't need all three um, of those requirements, just kind of one suffices. Um, so firstly, you could get a H1 or H2 in Leaving Cert higher level maths. That's obviously easier said than done. 
Um, but there is like a lot of complex maths involved in the road to becoming an actuary. Um, so you would kind of want to have a strong aptitude for maths and also enjoy it. Um, but there's a lot of people, maybe it doesn't go like your way on the day. And um, that doesn't mean you can't become an actuary and there are other options. Um, so you can do an undergraduate course. Um, you'd need to get a third class honours or higher in any mathematical degree. Um, or alternatively, you can get a second class honours or higher, um, as well as a C in your leaving cert in a mathematical subject. Now, I know it's not done. Um, I think a C would be a H3 or a H4 now. Um, I think they haven't updated their website. Um, but that being said, there are a few different routes um, to becoming an actuary, which Yvonne kind of touched on. Um, so the first bullet point there is probably the most common. That would be from your leaving cert to go and do a degree in actuarial and financial studies. Um, that's what I would have done. And then from there, go and get a job and do your professional exams. Um, I think a common misconception can be that when you graduate from college, studying an actuary degree that you are a qualified actuary I definitely in transition year would have thought that and um, that's not the case though um, so yeah there are exams to do afterwards which is why yeah the professional exams is down there as well um, alternatively then it, maybe you didn't get your H1 or your H2 you could go and do an undergraduate course in some other subject and then optionally, you could do a master's in actuarial and financial studies to get some exemptions there. Um, but if not, that's not required, you could just go straight to working and doing your professional exams from your undergrad. Um, and then finally, it's worth mentioning, um, it is technically possible from your leaving cert to just go straight into a job in the insurance industry um, and do all of the exams that way through work. It's really not the done thing anymore. I think it would have been quite common in the past, um, but it is technically an option. So um, worth mentioning. Um, so moving on, this slide is kind of uh, looking at all of the different college courses that Ireland has to offer for actuarial, actuarial and financial studies. Um, so there are six colleges to choose from and each of them has a different points requirement. I'm not gonna quote the different points requirements because they change quite a bit um, year on year. Um, a lot of the courses include a placement. Um, so that's where students do work experience in an insurance company or some other company in the industry uh, for a number of months. So I did mine in a global reinsurance company um, and it's like a really good experience. It really kind of shows you if you will like it after college because you could always go and work in some other area if you didn't, um, which I did really like it. Um, even though mine was over COVID, so a lot of it was working from home um, in 2020 when people hadn't really figured that out yet. So I maybe didn't get the full placement experience, but a lot of people do say it is kind of the highlight of their college experience. Um, and you can go abroad for your placement as well. Um, one of my best friends went to New York and worked there, which was really cool. Um, and I know people that went to Glasgow and London as well. Um, so lots of options there. Um, the last column on this slide is referring to exemptions. And I know a few of us have kind of touched on those now, but I just kind of want to explain it properly because again, I don't think I would have understood that in transition year. So basically to become an actuary, there are 12 exams you have to sit. So in if you do an actuarial degree in college, you can get exemptions from some of those exams. So that's where some of the modules you sit are basically equivalent. Um, like cover the same material as the exams you would have been doing through the IFOA. Um, so they cover the same content, they're examined in a similar way. And that means if you get a high enough grade in those exams, you essentially, you don't have to do them after college. So you, you, you've already kind of bagged them through your degree. Um, usually that means getting a, a quite a high grade, like maybe an A or a B. Um, but it's brilliant uh, because obviously it kind of makes the road to qualifying a lot faster. Um, and yeah, all of the different colleges in Ireland that have actuarial courses offer some number of exemptions, which is great. Um, so finally, I'm just gonna talk a bit about the professional exams, uh, which we have all referred to so much. 
Um, so as I mentioned, there's 12 in total um, and you do those exams while you're working. So the way that works is companies provide paid study leave in the months coming up to the exam. So it's usually a, a day a week or you might take two half days every week to go and study. And um, so that's really helpful. Um, and then there's two exam sittings every year, one in April and one in September. And you can do as many exams as you want each sitting, but they are quite difficult. So people would tend to usually do maybe one or two to properly focus on it um, and get the pass. So we had exams there last week. Some people are still sitting them this week as well. And um, so exam season is in full swing. Um, and then looking at the different exams that you have to pass, there's kind of four different categories. The first one, core principles, is like the more technical or mathematical um, examinations, looking at areas like economics or accountancy, um, and then obviously statistics and maths as well. Um, and then these are usually the exams that colleges would offer exemptions in. Um, one college, I think UCD offers an exemption in one of the core practices as well, but otherwise any of the exemptions would be in these core principles. Um, so then, yeah, the core practices exams, they're more practical. So two of the exams are fully kind of practical. One of them is a modeling exam where you kind of make a model. Um, and another one is a communication skills exam, kind of like writing a letter or something. Um, and then the third one there, that's kind of, that's a risk management exam, quite a big exam. Um, and then the last two categories, the specialist principles and specialist advance, here students select two for the spe specialist principles, um, two out of about seven different areas. And usually you choose like areas that relate to your line of work. And um, so because Milliman deals a lot with life insurance and health insurance, um, they're the exams that I chose, but friends of mine did general insurance, which is more like car insurance and things like that, um, or pensions exam, risk exam. Um, so there is a lot to choose there um, and you kind of get to hone in on what you enjoy as well, which is nice. Um, and then for the specialist advance, it's just basically a deeper dive into one of the areas that you chose for your specialist principles. Um, and then to kind of answer what Susan um, was asking about life, working and studying, it's honestly not as bad as it may seem. Um, having the study day a week is, makes it very bearable. Um, people kind of talk about giving up your life in, during exam season. It, that's not really the case. Maybe the month of April can be tough and the month of September, but in general, um, it's not too bad. Um, yeah, if you kind of just taken taken away at the study over the few months before the exam, it, it makes it very bearable. And yeah, it's, it's definitely not too bad. Um, so yeah, hopefully I've been kind of helpful. Um, and I think that's everything I wanted to say. Well, Alison, thank you very much indeed for that. And also for giving us the real deal, the real deal <laughs> as well as regards what, what happens. By the way, I'm just interested there that some somebody did ask uh back here how do you know what to study for the exams and elaine is answering that there in the in the background so again i'm glad that, that you've alluded to that and just to give that real sense of what it's like when when it happens how it happens and support the support that, that you get along the way so we really appreciate your time tonight alice and thank you very much indeed for being with us thanks everyone and so we're now going to move into the next part of the session which is where i'm going to ask you to think like an, like an actuary. So I have a range of questions here and I am going to, uh, first of all, I'm going to put a link into the chat. And in here, what I'm going to do is I am going to ask you, and I'm just going to make sure here that all is good. I am yeah, going to ask you to click on this. Now, if you are on a separate device, I am also going to give you a QR code, okay? so. Here we go. This is going to everyone. Okay. So can I ask you all to click on that, please? And if not, if you're not there, then instead, I'm going to give you a QR code. No, I'm going to do that. So I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Let me share my screen here. And now you should be able to 
hold up your if you're for example if you're watching this on a laptop and you're using you want to use your phone pull up your camera okay i can see there we've arranged people here who are who are liking that yep so please do like it please do indeed like it so that then i know that you're there and i will take it from there okay i can see yeah, loads and loads of people brilliant all right so if at any stage you get stopped out, we need to join again, you can you can uh, use the code up there at the top. Go to menti.com and use the code at the top. But for now, I'm going to assume that we're all good. Now, let me just test out the second element of this tech, not just that you can join, but also that you can answer. So there are three questions in the background here. So when you have now moved on, because I have made this to be presenter paced, which means that you're following me. So if I can ask you now to fill out the three questions that are now appearing on your screen, this is just going to reassure me that our tech is all good. If you're using this in a mobile device, you'll need to scroll down past the picture of the woman here tapping the microphone. Okay, I can see the first one is in there. So I'm going to give people a couple of moments. And then from there, I'm going to ask you to think like an actuary. I have a range of data. Okay, I can see five. So I'm going to stop sharing there for a moment and give you a chance to do that. And we are now at 22. Okay, we're nearly there. Well, there's a lot more than that here now, but we're, I'm just going to give this, okay, 27. It's now 1952. I'm going to give this until 1953 or 33. So like I say, after this, I'm going to give you a range of questions for you to think about. I have the answers. I'm going to be showing you the answers, but I'm going to give you a range of things to think about. Okay, we're right, we're at 1953. First question then is this. Rank these experiences in terms of risk. Because of course, as you've heard everybody say so far, you've heard Alison, you've heard Yvonne, and you've heard, you've heard Sinead. They all talk about risk. It's pricing and risk. It's considering risk, et cetera. So my question to you is this. Rank these experiences. Again, if you're on a mobile device, you need to go down past the picture of the, the person you're walking the title. So, so far, I'm saying nothing now because I know the answer to this until you're done. Okay, we have 18 people and rank them all. Okay, rank them all. So, so far we have, we're, we're on about Nick. Okay, playing sport is now gone ahead crossing the road a second to going to school is next i'm going to let this run for another 20 seconds so counting ahead 14 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 okay the answer is correct in the way that it appears that actually the in terms of the three things that i put forward to you there the riskiest thing to do is playing sport. Uh, my brother's a hurler. I have been on the pitch plenty of times when I have seen that that play out. Uh, playing sport, and of course, that can there's various different sports that have different levels of risk associated with them. So if you are applying, for example, for travel insurance, then you, they, the travel insurer might restrict maybe skiing or certain activities like bungee jumping or various other ones that have elevated levels of risk as distinct to other sports. But there is an understanding and an analysis of what risk happens according to which sports in which environments. The safest thing to do here of the three that I gave you is to be in school. Least accidents actually happen in school. Most accidents happen in the home. So crossing the road is actually in between the two. OK, next one is this. So as, as soon as I move this forward, I'll be asking the next question. So there's a new housing development that has been built in a town close to you. If you were thinking like a house insurer, so think like a house insurer, what factors might affect the premium that an insurer would charge to you as a home buyer? So you're think like an insurer now. What factors, what questions would you ask people who are buying this new house in the town close to you? What factors? So let's think about what factors, what questions would you be asking? So what factors might affect the premium and insurer charges to home buyers? Okay. Mm -hmm. 
and this is related to health insurance. Okay. So far, I have five answers. Just think. Re remember what what is insurance for? Insurance is for insuring risk. So what risks? What questions do you need to ask to assess the risks? And also remember the principle of insurance is asking a range of people, a lot of people for a little bit, so that you can help out people at the time that they need it most. 17 answers so far. Now you're now you're really getting going. Now the the more often something appears, then the the bigger the text becomes. I am at 37 answers. Okay, I'm going to start I'm going to start responding to, to some of these. So the source of finance, interesting. So uh, would you would you look at a house differently if it was financed by a mortgage versus cash, for example? Geography. So where is it? The crime in the area, natural disasters, the builder that made the house, structure and foundation, security system. Yes, indeed, you're correct that there is a difference between the price of insurance that you will pay if you have an alarm versus if you don't. Uh, the value of the house, is there a fireplace, the land size, previous weather, flooding, burglar alarm, um, security of the job. Interesting. OK, so you're also saying that the uh, that the insurer would also determine how much the house be, would be or the factors that would contribute to the insurance of the house based on salary of the people who own it. OK, or perhaps rent it, perhaps. Um, you've type of roof, theft, danger, square foot area. Mm -hmm. Is it a first time buyer? The price of a house, robbery, history of health, defensible space. And yeah, so the bigger ones here are the value of the home. Mm -hmm. You're right there. Value of the home, uh, crime, location, security, near water, etc. Okay, you're really thinking right now. These are exactly the type of things where ultimately the question that I really asked you is, what determines the risk and how high or low those risk levels are. Okay, I'm very happy with that. Right, next one. Now, what is the average life expectancy of a person in the world on average? The first, the first, I'm going to show you the statistics on this. I'm going to give you the statistics on this. So I'm going to, and they're all in between 15 and 100. I intentionally chose them in between 15 and 100. There is a difference between the life expectancy of a man and a woman. But the first answer is a person in the world on average, Whole, the whole world, now developing and developed world. And then a woman in Ireland and a man in Ireland, I want to see what you think. A person in Hong Kong, so on average between a man and a woman, a man in the UK and a woman in Dubai. I'm grateful to say I've actually been in all of those places, including the world, like all of you have. <laughs> so where do you think it is? I'm just going to stop and think, I'm going to give you a chance here to think. And this time I'm going to show you where I would find the data. So lots of you saying 82 points. Actually, I won't comment now till, till you have a chance. Okay, 21 answers. And this is precisely, of course, what you would do as an actuary, because what you need to consider is how long is a person expected to live and then how can you price an insurance policy, let's say on the basis of life insurance or their pension so that you can give them enough money to have so, so that they can live comfortably for the rest of their lives, but also making sure that the money that is put into that pension or put into that investment to take care of that person is also sufficient. Okay, 37 answers. Now, here is on this occasion, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you, for the first time, I'm going to show you the data. The next time I'm going to give you a calculator to help you figure this out yourself. But for now, I'm going to show you data. OK, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this over here. And this is the worldometer. This is the worldometer when it looks to the life expectancy of the world population. So on average, a person in the world is 73.2 years. Ah, higher, a lot higher, in fact, a lot higher than what the average is here. Now, I can see that there's a load of people here have chosen all sorts of other numbers, but it is higher than, than you think. So a woman in Ireland, let's look at that one. A woman in Ireland, let me go, I want to control F is a great book. So a woman in Ireland is, female life expectancy, is 84.32. 82, two years, <laughs> two years more than, than what you're expecting. A man in Ireland, you're saying 77. Hmm. 
a man in Ireland is expected to live until he's 82. Wow, you're really underestimating life expectancy here so far. Okay, now let's go for a person in Hong Kong. The reason I picked Hong Kong, by the way, is apart from it being a wonderful place to go, is it is at the top of the table. So um, in Hong Kong, a person in Hong Kong can expect to live to 85.29 years, highest of the table. Next, uh, and you said 79.3, much I think the years higher than that. A man in the UK, you said 77. Okay, interestingly here, so what I'm seeing is that you expect a man and a, a man in the UK and a man in Ireland have the same life expectancy. Is that the case? Well, I know the answer. But if I jump across here, so a man in Ireland would live, is expected to live until 84.32. Sorry, no. A man in Ireland is 81.29. Sorry, 81.29. Um, and the UK is actually significantly lower. It's 80.22. Now, in general, you've underestimated both of them. But it just shows you that the life expectancy of a man in Ireland today is actually higher than the life expectancy of a man in the UK. And then I chose to go for a woman in Dubai. And the reason that I picked Dubai is that, uh, first of all, I was there quite quite recently. I was actually there. I was running with uh, running a financial retreat with another business that's based out there. So I spent a bit of time out there and it has an amazing lifestyle, of course, as I'm sure a lot of you know. However, lifestyle and life expectancy are two very different things. So then if I look over here at the Worldometer and I scroll down to the United Arab Emirates, United Arab Emirates, here we are, is that uh, the life expectancy of a woman is 79.8 years, 79.8 years, which again, you've underestimated, but it is high, it is, it is lower than any of anything else that I showed you, uh, anything else that, that I showed you indeed, it is actually below average for across the world. So that was what, that, those are the types of data that somebody like Sinead takes into consideration. So she looks at life expectancy and says, okay, we need to make sure that when we're structuring a pension for a woman in Ireland, we need to take into consideration that her life expectancy is what I mentioned to you. How do we make sure that we can invest the money that she's put into the pension for long enough to make sure that she's paid out at the right time as she goes through her lifetime? That is the key question that somebody like Sinead is seeking to answer. Similarly, if we are, if, if you're going to be charging, let's say a, a, a man in the UK for life insurance, life insurance is where a man, in, let's say in the UK, pays into uh, an insurance policy. And when he dies, then that money is paid to the beneficiary of that insurance policy. Well, then you might say, well, if that life is insured, let's say for a hundred thousand euro or a hundred thousand pounds sterling in the UK, how much, does a company need to charge him every single month along the way so that then there is enough money to pay out to that beneficiary when the time comes? That's that's the way it works. Okay, so, so far what I'm learning about this audience very clearly is that you're underestimating life expectancy, um, interestingly, quite significantly. And also what, what I can clearly tell is that you knew though that there, the life expectancy of a woman is higher than that of a man. And I was particularly struck but the fact that you think a man in the UK and a man in Ireland has the same life expectancy. Okay, let's keep going. So now let's look at the next question. How much in euro is the full state pension in Ireland today? So if I was to retire, so my dad retired quite recently, how much money does he get from the government every year? Uh, now, I will say in order to get the state pension, you do need to have contributed 520 PRSI contributions. That works out at 10 years. So you need 10 years of contributions to the government. And then there's other things as well. It has to be on average that you make 48 contributions a year. So without getting into that technical stuff, it means that PRSI, pay related social insurance, that is the money that goes in to the government to take care of things like disability allowance or social welfare allowance or different things like that. But money, part of your income tax, goes into the government so that then they invest it on your behalf so that then when it comes to retirement age, then it can be paid out. What if you were to retire, like my dad is now, if you were to retire this year and be received the full state pension, how much would it be? Okay, I've only 33 answers so far. Uh, 35, I'm going to give this another 10 seconds. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The answer is 
well, it's actually 13,796. But when I was using this, it wouldn't let me round down that small of a number. So I just rounded it up by four euro to 13,800. So I can see there a range of different numbers. Again, you underestimated it. Hmm. So you, uh, on average, I can see here that a lot of the numbers tended to be more so towards the left hand side. So yeah, now that's the full, and I, I, I do stress that's the full state pension. One thing that I do want to make a point though, is that from a government point of view, what they also want to do is to make sure that people who are working from home, and when I say working from home, I mean who are acting in a caring capacity. So anyone who is in receipt of carers allowance or children's allowance, their PRSI contributions or their income tax contributions are frozen. So that then while they may not be in employment, the government still looks at that as though they are working, but doing a different sort of work. And then they would also be in receipt of full state pension if they meet those other rules that I mentioned. Okay. Next one, where do you think is the best pension system in the world? So I've now told you a couple of different elements of the state pension system in Ireland, because the, the government is a massive pension provider and a massive, um, it, it, uh, it's, a, it's a place, or the government has a role of taking money off us at various different stages, investing it in our behalf and giving it back to us at a later stage. So I'm currently paying income tax, and then my dad is now in receipt of pension uh, of a pension. So that's the way in which they have to manage the money. Mm. A lot of you were voting for Australia, New Zealand, okay. Yeah. Nordics, okay. So I again I'm going to keep show you an answer. Now, this is also partly of what a uh, of what a uh, an actuary does. But particularly one of the actuarial firms that I'm going to show you produced a report on this for 2022. I've heard seven answers. OK, here is what I can see so far is that we're saying eight for Europe, two for, we'll say, Ireland and the UK. I know it's pretty small, but to be fair, 14 of you, 14 out of 39 so far. That is around about a third. About a third of you have said uh, the Nordics. OK, uh, four of you saying Australia. And then there's other people have picked Japan. Some of you there have picked uh, the US, etc. Okay, please do keep your answers coming. But what I'm going to say is just change back to your screen so I can show you the answer. And the answer that I'm picking is coming from the Mercer CFA, uh, Global Institute Pension Index. And the top three, the A grade, is indeed Iceland, Denmark, and the Netherlands. So a mixture of the Nordics and, and Europe. After that, then we have Israel, Finland, Australia. So the four of you there were right and Norway, they're the B grade, B, sorry, B plus grade. After that, we have Sweden, Singapore, UK, Switzerland, Uruguay, South America, uh, Ireland, that this is where we are, New Zealand, Chile, Belgium, Germany. And after that, then we go further down, down the list. So the answer is the Nordics, but as I don't know if you're aware, I'm my background, by the way, is that I studied financial maths and economics in, in NUI Galway, with a view to going on to becoming an actuary. Instead of going down the road of actuary, I instead went to set up my own business. And as you can see, um, I now work with a range of different elements. But one of them that I picked up on really uh, and really backed after I did what I did, was doing in college is the economic side of things. So I just want to make the point that the Nordics would be very high tax countries. But as you can also see, then there's a lot of welfare as well. OK, this is the last set of and this time it's a set of questions that I'm going to ask you. Right. First of all, I'm going to ask you for the answer to this one, this question. Imagine you're 25. You're earning 30,000 euros per year. You want to have 25,000 per year when you retire at the age 60, 67. How much should go into your pension right now monthly? So monthly. Think of this on a monthly basis. Mm, 5,000. Okay. Right, there's a really big difference between these two numbers, 450, 5,100, okay. Four answers so far. Nine answers. No, there's, a, okay, a world of a difference here. We're going from 8,000 down to 100 euro. 100 won't get you very far anyway.
we've got 20, 21 answers. Okay. Now, I am going to put a link into the chat. So what I'm going to ask you is all to, to work this out with me. Okay, here's the way this here's here's the way this goes. This is the pensions calculator from the Pensions Authority website. Now let me walk through the answer here to this. Imagine that you're 25. I'm going to change the age here to 25. I'm earning 30,000 euros a year. Three zero one two three. I want to have 25,000 a year when I retire, and I want to retire at 67. 67. And I want to have 25,000 euros per year. Okay. Also, I'm I'm not the current pension scheme at the moment. Let's just say. So the answer is I'm going to calculate that right now. The the answer is because, of course, remember I am going to get the state pension as well. That's that's assumed. The answer is down here is that net contributions per month, net being the amount of after tax pay, would be four hundred ninety eight. Now, whoever said five hundred over here. Which was, I thought I saw 500. Hmm. I didn't. I saw 5,000. I remember that. So I think here 450 euro, whoever said 450 euro was actually closest. That is how much of my take home pay I would need to put into a pension. However, in reality, more than that would go in because there is what's called tax relief. This is where the government incentivizes you to put money into your pension. It says, okay. If you're going to take money out at a later stage, out of your pension, which, of course, that's the intent, is that you live until then, then you take money out. Well, then, of course, you're less at risk of the government needing to help you out more, whether it might be with healthcare or other things, and the more you can spend when you're retired. So the government wants you to do this. So it gives you tax relief. And tax relief means that if you earn €498, Euro, you would have paid €75 Euros in tax on that. They, instead, allow you to put the whole lot into your pension pot. So 573 euros in total all goes in there. So as you can see here, this is the way it works. Now that you have the pension calculator, I'm gonna ask you this question. Can you now answer the next one accurately based on the link that I've put in there? Okay. So now that you have got the pension calculator, you should be able to get this one right. And after that, we are going straight in to our panel discussion then, when I have lots of questions to put to our panel. So you're 35 this time. You're earning 30,000 euros per year. You want to have 25,000 euros per year when you retire at age 67. How much should go into your pension now? Eight of you have answered. Answers are much, much, much tighter now. Much, much, much tighter now. You see, when you actually have a tool, and that's the model that Sinead was talking about earlier, when you actually have a tool in order to actually make this happen, then you can look at this very differently because then you're not guessing. There is a model that you can actually go and follow. See, answers are much, much, much tighter. Okay, I'm going to run through this. So imagine that you're 35. Okay, so I'm just going to. So this time, 35. That's the that's the variable that I'm changing. 35, earning 30,000 euros a year. You want to have 25,000 euros a year when you retire. And now let's see. Let's calculate this. There we go. This time, the net contribution of your take-home pay is 643 euros a month, and the gross amount per month that you would go in would would be 743 euros less tax relief would be 100 euro. Now, of course, I could ask you all sorts of other questions like what would happen if you started instead at age, at age 40 or age 45 or age 50? What would you do then? What if you were to retire at a, if you wanted a higher amount? What if you want to retire earlier? What if you wanted to take more risk? All of those what ifs is ultimately an actuarial job is to consider how you would consider that. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now and we're going to pop back to the mentee at the very, very end. But before I do that, I am now going to ask each of our three panelists to please switch on your camera. 
So I'm going to give you a moment of that. Hello, Elaine. You are very welcome indeed. Thank you for being here with us. Hi, guys. Perfect. We can see you there now. And I'm also going to ask you there, Connor, would you mind renaming <laughs> as you're appearing uh, there as Alison Walsh? <laughs> so if you could rename there, please. And Kleena, also, you're, you're very welcome indeed. Now, just again, to set the scene here, uh, Connor and Kleena, both of you, of course, were doing your exams over the past couple of weeks. So again, well done to you both for getting through there. And I hope that, that you had a little bit of time there to get some relaxation. Elaine, you haven't been doing that. You're, uh, you, you, you're through it all. So I'm going to start off first question. And of course, please do keep the questions coming in there, guys. Please do in the Q&A session. We can all see them anyway, but please do keep them coming in. Elaine, let's start, start off with you. It's a question that's come in loads of times. Can you tell us about the what goes on in the daily life of an actor? Yeah, sure. Um, and not to give a fluffy answer, but every day is different. And I think it's different for every actuary as well. Um, so maybe if I took kind of a typical week instead of a typical day, because um, it's, it's probably a bit different. Um, so I work as um, an investment consultant um, it, it, to pension plans. So I'm glad pensions came up as a topic. Um, and I suppose I, I have a role within our kind of market development as well. So kind of building our proposition and how we bring it to clients um, and then I have another role kind of within our risk governance um, offering as well so I kind of have a few different roles within the one company um, I suppose if I was looking at a typical week um, you generally have client meetings and um, you have obviously the work for those client meetings and um, that that work generally looks like things like investment strategy reviews so you know we work with pension plans and they obviously have the liabilities um, that need to be met, um, like you just saw in, in um, Susan's uh, example. Um, and really, it's up to us to kind of try and come up with investment strategies that make sure that we have enough cash at retirement to, to pay those pensions when they fall due. Um, so that's that's kind of a big piece of the work um, that, that we work on um, with our clients. Um, outside of that, then there's a lot of working with um, kind of different stakeholders within the company. So, you know, you work with your clients, um, but there's also a lot of work internally as well. So, you know, you work with maybe more junior actuaries on the team um, who probably do a lot of the harder work and do all the nuts and bolts and, and the numbers bit. Um, you know, you work with more senior actuaries to get a peer review so before you would issue advice to consult to, to a client and um, you generally get um, another actuary to peer review it and um, to challenge your advice to make sure that the advice you're giving is the best possible advice um, and then there's I suppose kind of beyond your team a bit of work as well so you know I work in the investment team we would generally give kind of investment updates investment insights to the wider Aon um, team um, and then as well I have that role around kind of um, proposition development so developing our solutions and um, so there's a bit of work there with people from different practices you know so um, I'm on the investment side there's an actuarial side to it there's an administration side to it and really trying to bring all those people together to put together a solution that we can bring to clients um, and then there's probably a bit of work with kind of maybe more senior management justifying the propositions that we've built and um, so it's really a very dynamic role um, and it really depends kind of on a day-to-day -day basis which one you're kind of focusing on um, and, and what's demanding your time. What a super answer Elaine that is a really interesting actuarial week thank you thank you very much indeed for that. I'm, go I'm going to ask a smaller question uh, to you Tina and I'm going to ask you to take a subset of what, what Elaine said. Could you tell us about an actuarial skill that you have and that you use on a daily basis so one skill uh, yeah, there is a few, I suppose, but um, to name one, I guess, is um, like problem solving analytical skills. Like we work a lot with data and um, we model the data and look at like trends within the data. So we look at like our frequency of claims and the severity of claims and we use this data to make projections. Um, so I work in capital modeling and the basis of this is we have to set up like the money that we hold for the company in case of like a massive risk cap. Uh, like a like a massive risk um, where the money we have set aside in our premiums don't cover um, this claim. So definitely a lot of modeling work. Um, so your problem solving or analytical skills come into play there. Okay. And the problem solving and the analytical, it sounds like one leads to the other. Is that when mm -hmm. you identify the problem, then you use your analysis yeah, to, definitely, to figure yeah. that out. It's a question, Connor, that comes up a lot. It's also come up in the, in the Q&A. 
is what subject should somebody focus on to become a successful actuary? Could you look at this maybe from a couple of different perspectives? If you're interested in it in leaving cert or on the way up towards leaving cert, if you are looking at this from the point of view of college and is there anything else one can do? Yeah, I suppose the obvious answer is always um, maths is the big one. It's the foundation of the whole um, profession, I suppose. But there definitely is other subjects which tie into it. Um, personally, myself in my own role at the minute, I'm doing a lot of reporting to uh, different committees and boards. So communication and English skills are actually something which are really a... Uh, really helping me out at the minute, which I did not expect at all uh, from this profession. And there's also a few exams like that, and they actually can be quite scary, but they definitely are worth it in the long run. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, like you could argue business subjects like economics and that, but I actually didn't do them in um, leaving. So I was always more kind of, um, I was doing the science subjects and I suppose they helped out with my maths, but yeah, there's, like everything ties into it, I suppose. There's, it's definitely not, um, it's it's not just black and white, like. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, all right, a lot of people wouldn't connotate the English and the communication, the, and particularly because a lot of you deal with very complex issues and conveying those to people who may or may not be technical. Elaine, something that Alison brought up there a lot is what it's like, what April is. It's like to study for the exams, and I, as I mentioned, Conor and Tina have uh, just come come through that basis. You come out the other side. What are the challenges and the rewards of pursuing an actuarial career, and how does it impact work life balance? Um, God, that's a that's a tough one. Um, so I suppose I would say the challenges um probably depend on the industry you're in. Um, so I suppose there is huge advancements in tech and, you know, is there fear that that takes away our jobs? Um, but obviously uh, somebody has to be writing the models and designing the tech. Um, I'd like to think that, you know, in a consulting role, there's always a there's always a value in a person standing in front of you. And um, so I think there is value in that. Um, I suppose in terms of what actuaries can do, um, I, I think. You know, all the advancements that we have only helps us to solve the problems quicker. Um, in a lot of ways, you know, um, you know, we have these events like where years ago it might have taken you, you know, weeks to run investment strategies. You know, we can do it in a couple of hours at this point. You know, we have these powerful tools so we get answers quicker. And ultimately, I think clients make d decisions quicker, which in an investment market is obviously really, really important. You know, that if you're kind of placing a trade, it's in, you know, um, at the most efficient time. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers it, Susan, or. Yeah. Well, I think you, you've given us a, a really important angle on it, Elaine, which is that as you're going through the process, it can feel different to looking back on it as well. But also yeah. one needs to figure out what work life balance also means them and, and work around it. Since Connor and Kina, since you've just come through, like studying for an exam at the same time as working, etc. Could I ask you both for your thoughts on that as well? How, how does that work out for you? Kina, do you want to go first and then Connor? Yeah, like it definitely has its challenges um, coming up to exam time and stuff. You like you you are studying and stuff after work and on weekends. But I think once you find the balance and like kind of make plans and schedules um, to like have your time off or to meet your friends or kind of make plans for the weekends, like it is really manageable. Um, and like it is a, a great job, but like great opportunity. So like it is worth it in the long run, especially once you get through them. So it's it's about having the long term versus the short term in mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Definitely. Thank you. Kleena. What Connor, what's your thoughts? Yeah, it definitely is manageable. And most it's 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 definitely something different to what most people would you would be used to uh, in terms of study, having to do work, having to work while studying, I suppose. And it's sometimes it can be difficult to switch off from one um to focus on the other. But most employers are very good. They provide good leave. And at the end of the day, like you probably have a bad couple of weeks leading up to the exam, but it's it definitely is manageable. And uh, some people will have horror stories, but I wouldn't read into them too much now. <laughs> good to hear you don't have it. Okay. <laughs> Makes anybody feel any better, you completely forget about it and you can just block out that part of your life once it's done. <laughs> yeah, it's going back to what Lena said again, short term versus long term. <laughs> 
Um, Elaine, one of the things that I, I've noticed come through there in the questions quite a bit is, I like maths, but I may not like algebra. That was one question there that, that we've seen come in, for example. Um, other people saying, like, how do I know if, if it's suitable for me? And how does somebody decide if the actuarial profession is the best suited career path for them? Um, I would say if, if you're a logical thinker, you know, removing subjects and everything else, if you're a logical person and you kind of like problem solving, then that's it's a good route for you. Obviously, you have to have a good mathematical basis, but ultimately, you know, you're taking real world problems that actually have a real impact on people. You know, you're investing people's money that determines their retirement outcomes, that sort of stuff. I think like I find that really exciting. Maybe other people don't, but I, I think it's it's really, you know, enjoyable and rewarding. Um, so I would think that that's it. You know, if if you like solving problems that have a real impact, I think that's 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 what I would say. That's such a beautiful way of putting it. If you like solving problems that have a real impact, there you go. Talk about an inspiring way to describe the profession. <laughs> um, we've had a question that has come in, which is what leading search subjects and courses did Connor and Tina do? So I'm going to ask you that, but I'm actually going to ask you, if you didn't do that, could you still, or sorry, not could you still, we know you could, how could you still be in the position that you're in today? So Connor, we go with you first this time. So what leading search subjects did you do? What course did you do? And then how could you have gotten here a different way? Yeah, so I suppose I went a traditional enough route now. Um, my, well, first of all, my leaving search subjects, uh, as I alluded earlier, I did chemistry, physics, uh, and applied maths on top of the normal subjects. Uh, and then I that got me into the actuarial course in UCD. Um, so that's obviously highly focused on uh it's not it's the course itself actually um it's a bit broader than the name suggests the name is actuarial and financial studies but like i'd say more than half of my course met, a lot of people from my course haven't actually done it actually but yeah the majority do and if i didn't do that course how could i be where i am today well i look at people that are in my exact job at the minute in like irish life where i'm working and they didn't do uh, actuarial jobs at an actuarial course there's for example there's one person who was <laughs> a qualified doctor decided mm -hmm. it wasn't for them and just started up in the actuarial exams and uh, so it, there's definitely um there's definitely many routes to it uh, so i wouldn't let the course define um what uh, what you do in the end yeah and Tina. Um, yeah, so I studied biology, physics and accounting for my leaving cert and that led me into uh, financial maths in UL. So I studied maths, but it wasn't as traditional. So I didn't do an actuarial science degree. Um, so by doing that, I didn't get the exemptions that people usually get doing the actuarial science degree. So I kind of started my exams from scratch. Um, and before I started, I in AXA now for a year but before that I was in a um a different role in banking and um, so it kind of just shows that you you can like you don't have to have the background to start into it and stuff like people do come from all sorts of backgrounds um and like the exams are all there so if you start from scratch you can you can still get into it and just to touch back on the point that Yvonne mentioned as well earlier is that you can actually go straight from school into a company and start studying for the exams as well. It would be a different road, obviously, because then you'd have to, to self-train and, and work in it in a different way, but it can be done. And then the other thing to mention is if you have a different degree, an entirely different degree, like mine was similar to probably more yours, Connor. Mine was financial maths and economics in Galway. Similar story to you too, Connor. Half of half of our crew went on to actually half of them didn't. I'm obviously part of the half that, that didn't. But if if I had done a degree in psychology or if I'd done a degree in veterinary, I could have gone down that road again. The course doesn't define your accessibility into it. Okay, L from getting into it to getting out of it, Elaine, are there opportunities for branching out of the actuary profession? Or if I could slightly maybe amend that question, we heard from Yvonne that there are plenty of ways to do it, but practically, are, how does one do that? Yeah, so I suppose the, the, the getting out of it is a huge, like... I mean, I would say, you know, being an actuary is a really, really good basis. I mean, you know, you have a really good background to do an awful lot of things kind of in the financial sector. Um, so, for example, you know, our CEO 
is a is an actuary and um, her predecessor was an actuary as well and um, so you know you can kind of go into that kind of wider business management and um, you know you can go into proposition development all that sort of stuff and um, and I suppose I would say as well you know while I'm an actuary working in my role you don't necessarily necessarily have to be an actuary either and um, so I work with an awful lot of chartered financial analysts so there's lots of different ways in which you can do these jobs um, both getting into them and getting out of them and I just think you know the actuarial background is it just gives you a really good um basis to approach problems in general no matter what they are um so yes Connor and Lena do you agree is it the basis I, I'm guessing your actions show me that you do but do you feel that it is indeed a great basis to build your career on and and if so why Elaine has shown her reason why but maybe Lena I go to you first uh, yeah, it definitely is a good basis. Like it gives you exposure to a lot of different things. Um, and like people do branch out, like people can go into like data science or the likes instead. Um, and there's there's always like different types of insurance and stuff that people can go into. So you're kind of not stuck in the one as well. And Connor, how do you look at it as as somebody relatively early in your career? Yeah, the primary reason I went in and decided to sit the exams was because of how well respected it is or how well respected the skill set is and that's exactly what it is it is a skill set it's not just a job title like you'd be foolish to think that an actor in 50 years time is going to be the same as an actuary today so it's, it's constantly evolving and I think the profession is in general is very like aware of that uh, that we do need to evolve and I suppose yeah it it I don't see our skill set being any less valued moving forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. And on that note, if you're to talk about the skill set being valued, let's just also think about another recent development, which is, of course, the more working from home. We've had this, this question in here from somebody who says, would you say there are opportunities for working from home or e-working in the actuarial profession? Now, Elaine, I can tell about your background it looks like Connor and Cleena, that's where you are right now. I'm in my office uh, at the moment. So uh, based on, on that, like where uh, we know where the, the companies you work for, but where do you spend your time working? Any one of you like to take that? I'm pretty split. Um, so I, I kind of go into the office maybe a day or two a week. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know if anybody's guessed my accent. I'm from Cork. So um, I also travel to our Dublin office quite a bit. Um, and I suppose as well, you know, we're getting back to a point where, you know, it is really easy to have meetings online and some clients really do like it because they can just dip in and out. Um, but, you know, you do have a lot of pension trustees, some who are member trustees, and they actually still really like to meet the people. Mm. Um, so there is a lot of going out and meeting clients um, and that's kind of happening more and more. So there is kind of a bit more travel involved in that. Um, but I guess on the back of that, you know, I think I think that's kind of when you build a relationship with a client. You know, most of the relationship building is on the way in and out of meetings, not actually in the meeting. Um, so I think that's actually a valuable thing to kind of get back to. So you can... But it's also a good idea to spend some time in the office or in out out on site. Kleena, what's your take on this? Uh, yeah, I'm about 50 50 as well. I go in about two days a week and then the rest from home. Um, I don't like I don't work with clients or anything, so I don't have that client facing aspect. But like generally it is good to go in and you get to meet people and working. I suppose when you're working in person with people, it's a lot easier to learn, especially as a trainee, actually. And you're learning from more the, from the more senior people. And there's a big difference there between what you're both saying. One, of course, in your case, Elaine, you're, you're customer or client facing and cleaning, you're not. But as you say, you, you get to learn from other people and and there's the learning on the job there, particularly of what, what, Yvonne, what Yvonne was talking about earlier. Connor, there is another element of the workplace, though, and that's the social life. And a question also has come in here to say, are the working hours good? Can you maintain a good social life as an actuary? So what's the verdict? Um, that's another reason why I actually looked to get into the profession uh, is I had heard that there was it was possible to have a work-life balance compared to other professions maybe like I had no interest working 12 or 14 hour days something some stories you'd hear of other um, professions but yeah personally myself with as I touched on earlier the 
there's good balance between the work and the study. But then when I am looking at the more senior people in my team and I'm looking at where I could potentially be in a few years' time, they're, they have a very good balance as well. Like there's very good culture in my organisation and there's, def- yeah, long story short, very good work-life balance in my, uh, in my situation anyways. Elaine, Connor there spoke about where he could be in a couple of years' time looking at his senior people. However, Elaine, there's another thing we can look at in a couple of years' time, and that is the advancement of technology. Now, in in my own team, we work with AI now every day. And this is a very recent development, I would say. AI has become mainstream since ChatGPT came out, which is really since last Christmas. How do you see the future of the profession evolving, particularly in the context of technology and automation? Yeah, so I think I kind of touched on some of this earlier, you know, I think you make your decisions faster and better and all that good stuff. Um, I think, you know, there is a piece around the AI and the chat GPT and, you know, that it, you know, it probably puts things, they probably phrase things better than I'd phrase it myself. So there probably is a role for it, you know, this is what I want to say, but this is, can I say it better? Um, So there probably is a role for it. Um, I think, you know, it's it's like everything. Um, it will progress. It will develop. Um, do I think it'll? I I still think you will need that human override. You know, um, even if it produces something, it's like anything. It still needs to be proofread. You still need to agree with it. You know, if you're putting your company stamp on it, it needs to be right. Um, so I think there is still a huge role for actuaries, but maybe it's maybe there's less of the um hardcore number crunching less of the hardcore you know writing things um but you know i think you'll still need to have those the tool set to kind of give your well-rounded advice you know get the message across um to clients um but yeah i think i think it can only be a, be a good thing perfect okay so on that note and that sounds really positive on on that note i do want to kind of bring together the last question that wraps it all up before I ask everybody to do one last thing on Mentimeter. Loads of people here ask about the hours, loads of people. I'm, and I'm getting it in all sorts of directions, like is it nine to five? What are the hours like, et cetera. So we've talked about the money earlier on. Yvonne spoke about that. We spoke about the progression earlier on. Yvonne, um, Sinead spoke about that. Alison, Kleena and Connor have all spoken about the, the, the interaction between the exams, et cetera. The one thing that we have not touched on yet is flexibility. So can I ask you your take on the hours both now and where they might be in the future? So what I mean by that is, A, are they fixed? B, are they long? And C, can they be flexible around whatever is important to you? So I might start with Connor, your your final word and any last piece of advice that you want to share with the audience as well. Yeah, with regards to the hours, uh, it's very flexible and especially with study. Um, most people are very reasonable about it. And a lot of it just comes down to you have to plan, let's say, like long-term plan of when you want your time off or when you want your study. And then you can work your work around it. Um, if you get me, but yeah, no, it's, I, I've been pleasantly surprised by the flexibility. I don't work nine to five. I can work eight to four. I can work 10 to six. I can take two hours for lunch someday if I need it, you know? And, my hours just cancel off. I, I'm judged basically off the work, the quality of my work rather than hours changed chained to a desk, um, which is the way I like it. And yeah, I suppose that's the flexibility thing. I but yeah, I don't have any um I don't have any other real words of wisdom, but um I wouldn't be put off by um any any stories about flexibility or anything like that. I think the the world has evolved since COVID anyway, so I do think that's less of an issue. Good point. And, and well made. Kleena? Uh, yeah, I'd have to agree with Connor. I have a lot of flexibility in mine as well, where like it's not strict nine to five, it's the same. We could do eight to four, um, like take long lunch or a few appointments and stuff. And like my team as well are, they're very easy going with your study days, your holiday. Um, like we usually plan our study days like a, a, like three months or so in advance of um of the exams and stuff or if you have any holidays it's grand so um it definitely is a very flexible job okay so and particularly and i'm glad you've added in the in the elements of holidays as well because that also is is a form of flexibility elaine mm-hmm. final word to you 
Yeah, I'd absolutely echo everything that Connor and Kino have said. You know, it is very, very flexible. Um, I think we're coming off a time as well where, you know, we've all been locked in our houses. Everybody has had a dog or a child appear in the background. Everybody's kind of realised that everybody has a life. Um, and, you know, kind of taking that time for yourself, you know, where before you'd be stepping out of an office and, you know, you might have thought, oh, where are they going? That's kind of, That kind of stigma is gone. It's like everybody has a life. You get your job done and that's it. Um, and I guess just on the time off piece, um, you know, I think if it's planned far enough in advance, it, it can be very flexible. Like, you know, in the last few years, I've taken a full month off. I've gone to Australia, New Zealand. I got married last year. I took six weeks off. You know, you can you can do it. Um, it just needs to be budgeted for. Um, so it is, yeah, re- really something I'd recommend. <laughs> well, if there was ever a profession that could long-term plan, it's actuaries. <laughs> to well, it is, be fair. Yeah. So on that note, thank you all, all three of you, uh, sincerely uh, for your time, for your wisdom, for your insights, for your honesty, and also indeed for the preparation and the delivery of everything that, that you've said here tonight. So thank you very, very much indeed to all three of you. So now on that note, I am going to ask for one last thing, and that is where I'm now going to ask everyone to pop back onto the link, pop back onto Mentimeter. I've just put the link there back into the chat. And we are going to now briefly ask you for your feedback so we simply want to ask you as you can see there now we simply want to ask you how was your experience so a couple of questions in there that will very much help us but also help you and the reason we do this is it's something that I'm a great believer in and I know that the people and, and the team that I, that I work with were great believers in is that if you just take a moment to think about what did I learn from this what can I take away from this what can I implement from this that often can really lock in the learnings And I'm very fortunate. I've gotten to work with the Society of Actuaries now for some time in various different capacities. And just to be able to take a moment to think about what did you learn? What was your experience of it? Like I say, it'll be both valuable to you and to us. So I'm just going to give you a couple of moments to do that. Now, again, you'll also see the numbers here that are coming in. And right now we are, I'm seeing five so far. I'm going to pop on over here and take a quick look at... The questions that have come in, again, there's been a range of them. And I know Elaine is still typing answers there. You have been an amazingly interactive audience. You really, really, really have. All There's so much uh, questions that you've sent into us. So many answers as well. All of the data points, as we would call them, or data points that have come in as well through the Mentimeter, through using the calculator and tightening up your answers to your expectations as well for the life expectancies, to comparing the pension system in Ireland and others to looking at the full state pension that we really have wanted to design an experience for you all here this evening where you could truly, truly, truly think like actuaries. And I'm just struck by how many of you are asking questions that have a very real and practical nature, like what you might want to study or like the practicality of what it's like to work in that specific job, etc. All of those things really matter and they help people make decisions when it's about choosing your leaving cert subjects or choosing your course or choosing an apprenticeship or choosing a pathway that, that you might plot, either in general or for now, so, so that uh, as, you, as you might look forward. Now, I'm going to leave, leave that, that sheet open there on, uh, on that form, so we're going to be hearing, hearing your thoughts in there over the next while. To bring tonight to a close, I want to first of all point out that we have been recording this session. It is going to be shared with you. We will be following up with, with an email with you also as well, so you will be able to go back and take a look at all of those. Please do reach out to the Society of Actuaries Register for the mailing list. If any of you ticked that you wanted to be part of the mailing list when you registered for tonight's webinar, your your details will automatically go into the newsletter there. And as a result, you will be in receipt of the elements that uh, happen in the Society of Actuaries in Ireland. Also, of course, you can follow them on Twitter, follow them on LinkedIn, follow them wherever uh, you are participating on social media. We can always, of course, make sure that that Um, or sorry not that we make sure they make sure as well that there's lots and lots of updates there it is a very lively society there's loads of ways of getting involved as you go on and you progress through the profession and also of course as some of you may know um, I'm very grateful to say that I work with the Society of Actuaries to lead their transition year work experience program 
So that's in plan. Uh, our TY programme for this year has already happened, both of them, uh, but we're planning uh, lots more again to happen in the academic year of 23-24. Now, I can see that the feedback is still, still coming in here, which is brilliant, and we're delighted to have that. But on that note, I'm going to bring tonight's proceedings to a close. Thank you so much indeed to every single one of you who've been here. Thank you to Yvonne, thank you to Sinead, thank you to Alison, thank you to Connor, thank you to Tina, thank you to Elaine. And I also want to give a shout out as well to uh, Caroline, Chloe and Eva who are in the background taking care of everything, as well as a wide variety of other people who have made tonight happen. So on that note, thank you all for being here. Every best wish from me, Susan Hayes-Culleton. I wish you all the very best. Please do keep in touch. We'll see you again soon. Bye.